Hello, family, and welcome. We're Bob and Penny Lord. Women have always played an important part in God's plan for salvation, from Genesis up until the present day. In certain instances, women's contributions have changed the course of church history. We'd like to share with you one woman who has made an indelible mark on our church, Meet St. Clair of Assisi. Many of us know little or nothing about St. Clair, and those who do only learn of her after they have had their first encounter, that is, with St. Francis, the poor one of Jesus. The truth of it is that St. Clair is as much a part of the Assisi experience as Francis, and possibly the strongest and truest follower of Francis the world has ever known. She was and is a powerful saint in her own right. And we see evidence of that through the centuries by those who have followed her. She has been called Sister Moon to Brother Francis' son. As Mother Mary is the moon reflecting the light of Jesus, so Claire is Sister Moon reflecting the light of Francis. Claire was born of the nobility of Assisi, as opposed to Francis, who came from a wealthy family of merchants. The Lord had plans for Claire from her earliest days. She was always a good and spiritual girl. She was obedient to her parents, caring for the poor, loving to others, very unlike many young women of her time and station. Claire was breathtakingly beautiful all her life. This made her very desirable in the marriage market. Very often marriages were uh, anticipated and negotiated during the childhood of the boy and the girl. This was not the situation in Claire's case, however. She had a mind of her own. She was determined not to marry, though she didn't know why. The Lord had touched her heart from childhood. He was to be her spouse. But it took someone she respected to make this known to her. That someone was Francis de Bernadoni, our Francis of Assisi. Possibly the only thing the nobility and merchants of Assisi agreed on was the anger that rose up in them when they heard the name of Francis. To their way of thinking, he had disgraced his family, had stolen from his father to give to beggars and lepers and rebuild broken down churches. He must surely be crazy. To add fuel to the fire, he attracted many of the sons of nobility of Assisi. They kept flocking to join him in his insanity. They left their homes, had given up their possessions, and donned the coarse black sackcloth tunic that Francis wore. Claire knew the reaction she would get every time she mentioned the name of Francis, but she couldn't help it. She was fascinated by him, what he had done, and what he was preaching about living the gospel life. It was so contrary to anything she had ever heard before. She had known him over the years, but had never spoken to him. She had to meet him. One day, she just happened to choose to go walking on the very road she knew he would be taking. They met. Francis knew Claire. He could see in her that very special quality that Jesus would use someday. When their eyes met, the heavens opened up and the Holy Spirit entered into them. They gazed into each other's souls. Finally, Francis spoke to Claire. You will have to know how to die. Claire didn't understand what he was saying. What do you mean, she asked him. He replied tenderly, on the cross with Jesus. She still didn't understand, but she felt an unexplainable excitement surge through her. She couldn't get him out of her mind. Over the next few months, they met often. She listened in awe as Francis shared the love he had for Jesus and the gospel life. She was determined to join him, even though she was only 18 years old. Francis gave a Lenten service at the Church of San Giorgio. Claire went to listen to him. She was inspired by his powerful witnessing of the gospel life. She went to him after the, the service. She had made up her mind to join him. She asked him to help her to achieve the goal, they planned for her to enter the community the following Sunday, which was Palm Sunday. On that day, Claire went to the Palm Sunday Mass with the rest of the young girls of Assisi. They were all dressed in their Easter finery. The young girls sat in one section of the church together. 
when the bishop finished his homily, he, he blessed, he gave blessed palms to the people of Assisi. First of all, the adults went up to receive them, and then the procession of young unmarried girls. When the rest of the young girls processed up to the altar, Claire remained in her pew. She didn't know why she wasn't going up with the rest of them. She just knew she was to stay in her pew with her head bowed. The bishop noticed that she had not gone up as had the rest of the church. After the bishop gave palms to the young girls, he walked down to where Claire was sitting. He blessed her and gave her palms. That evening, Claire left her home for the last time. She went with her faithful companion Pacifica to the Pozziuncle, the little portion, the first church of St. Francis and his companions. Francis, his followers, and a priest representing the bishop awaited her. Pacifica removed Claire's jewelry and helped her to change from her beautiful Palm Sunday dress into a coarse habit tied at the waist. Claire stepped across her gown and left off her shoes and walked up to Francis. She knelt before him and he cut off her beautiful blonde hair. Then he placed a woolen cloth over her head. Being very proper, he brought her to a Benedictine monastery nearby until he could set up a convent for her. An interesting aside, the gown which Claire wore that day as well as her blonde curls have remained intact and can still be seen at the Basilica of St. Clair in Assisi. Pacifica returned home and told the family what Claire had done. As soon as Claire's family found that she had run away to Francis, war broke out. The uncles who had sworn to protect the daughters gathered as one with Uncle Minaldo in charge and stormed the Porziuncola. When they found that she had been moved to a Benedictine monastery, they converged on that place. They cursed, they shouted, they threatened, all to no avail. Finally, Uncle Manaldo changed his tactics. He became sugar sweet. Claire agreed to see him, but chose the chapel as the meeting place. Claire stood at the altar with her hand clutching the altar cloth, a symbol that she was under the asylum of the church. Uncle Manaldo spoke sweetly at first, but when he realized he was getting nowhere, he and his men began to pull at Claire, trying to drag her out of the church. The men were not able to budge her. Finally, she removed the woolen covering from her head. When they saw that her hair had been cut, it was as if she was dead. They turned and left the convent. Francis gave Claire and her poor ladies, as they were called, the convent of San Damiano, where the Lord had come alive on the cross and spoke to Francis, telling him to go and repair my church, which, as you can see, is in ruins. Claire knew how important this church was for what a sacrifice it would be for him to give it to her. Because once she and her ladies moved in, Francis would be hesitant about coming back again. It was his own rule. He made a point of keeping a very respectable distance from Claire and her ladies. Claire stayed at the convent of San Damiano for the rest of her life. If anyone had any doubt as to the sincerity of Claire's vocation, they had but to visit the convent of San Damiano. Claire's rule was austere. The bodies, the, uh, the ladies wore no stockings or sandals at any time of the year. They lived in the worst possible conditions. They had no beds. They slept on twigs with patched hemp for blankets. There were cracks in the ceiling of the upper floor of the convent. They ate little or no meat at all, but whatever they did eat was food they begged for. Claire fasted more than the rest. If the meager amount of food the extern sisters brought in was not enough to feed all of them, Claire made sure the others ate first, and she fasted. Claire was very wise <clears throat> for her age. Although she was only 18 when she joined Francis and his followers, she had the wisdom and love of a woman of much greater years. She treated her ladies as her children. Claire was a woman, undeniably a holy woman and a committed woman, but in the final analysis, a woman. Two instances in her life bring that out very clearly. Now, she knew that Francis was only a catalyst that Jesus had used to bring her to his bosom, but there had been that attraction. Both Francis and Claire knew that their relationship would never go beyond the spiritual. 
But it seemed that the moment she joined his community, she was cut off from him completely. He ran all over Italy preaching and spreading the gospel life, and that was good. She could understand that. They were called to different walks, but she had a problem. He avoided her completely. One time she heard he was back in Santa Maria degli Angeli after having finished a tour of preaching. She asked to share a meal with him. Francis refused. Even his friars felt that he was being a bit hard on Claire. Finally, Francis gave in, but he thought rather than his going to San Damiano, it would be good for Claire to get out of the convent, so he would bring her over to Santa Maria degli Angeli. She brought one of her ladies with her. They stopped first at the Porzioncola to pray. This held such memories for Claire, as it was here she had made her commitment to join Jesus through Francis. Then Francis took her on a little tour of the community, after which they went out into a wooded area to share a meal of stale bread. But before they ate, they prayed. Their prayers became so intense, the Holy Spirit filled everybody present. A bright light emanated from the place so much so that the local townspeople thought there was a fire in the woods in Santa Maria degli Angeli. They all came out with buckets of water to put it out. What they found, to their surprise, was not a fire, but an aura around Francis, his follower, Claire, and her lady. After they finished praying, the light went out. The townspeople left, as did Francis and Claire. They had never touched a bite of the food. The second instance took place sometime later, and it was very dramatic, in that Claire got her Italian up. Francis had gone back to his old ways of avoiding the poor ladies. He never gave them any spiritual direction. Claire felt deeply that she and her ladies needed his teaching on the gospel life. She had never regretted trading the luxuries of her life for the way of the gospel. If there was not enough food to eat, she could handle that. If there were no wine, that was better yet. But there was a great need for spiritual food. She could not allow her ladies to be deprived of this. Francis, on the other hand, felt the need to turn Claire and her ladies completely over to the Lord. To compound the problem, he even instructed the brothers who brought provisions to the poor Claire's not to speak to the ladies of spiritual matters, only their physical needs. Claire felt it was time for action. She and her ladies went on a hunger strike. She would not accept any more food or oil from Francis. She told her ladies, if we are to be deprived of our spiritual nourishment, we will be able to manage also without their material help. When Francis heard of Claire's decision, he moved quickly. He went over to San Damiano like a shot. The ladies were so excited that their spiritual father was going to teach them. Francis was a little at ease. They formed a circle, and he sat in the middle. He meditated for a few minutes, and filled with the Holy Spirit, he spoke words that touched their hearts. The more inspired he became, the more beautiful the words that flowed from him. Then he went into a deep silence which he left them. The ladies were in ecstasy for days. Claire said a prayer of thanksgiving to the Lord coming through again. Claire had given up all material possessions gladly for the Lord, but the most difficult for her to give up was her beloved Francis. Throughout their ministry, both Francis and Claire lived on the edge physically. Their years of fasting, Mortification and penance took a drastic toll on their bodies. There were times when both saints were so ill to the point of death that no one could be sure who would outlive the other, Francis or Claire. But when Claire saw Francis coming to the convent after having received the stigmata in September of 1224, she knew it was just a matter of time. He went to San Damiano to be nursed by the, by the sisters. He thought it would be acceptable because he was considered a crucified Christ. He was almost blind and in constant pain, especially in his eyes. He described the pain in his eyes as great splinters of glass scratching against his pupils. He suffered in his sides, hands, and feet from the wounds of Jesus. 
His internal organs were disintegrating, his stomach ulcerated from fasting, and his spleen destroyed by fatigue. When he arrived at the convent of San Damiano, though it was bright daylight, he groped around as if he were walking in the dark of night. Claire met him and gently helped him inside. A small hut was set up for him on the balcony because he would not allow himself to sleep inside the convent. It was here he composed the magnificent Canticle of the Creatures. Claire knew as he staggered away from the convent back to Santa Maria degli Angeli that she was losing him. That next year and a half may have been the most difficult time for her. For the Lord was good in that he was preparing Claire for the time to come. Word came from Santa Maria degli Angeli during the first days of October in 1226 that Francis was dying. He had been brought back from the bishop's residence in Assisi. He knew his mission was coming to a close and he wanted to be at the Porziuncola for the end. When Sister Death closed in on Francis, Claire felt as though her heart were being ripped out of her body. Her whole world crumbled. She was inconsolable. She had to be with him. But because her life of fasting and austerity had taken a toll on her health, she too was closer to death than life. She could not be with him. Francis knew Claire's condition and refused to allow her to come to visit him. He sent a blessing back to the ladies, and with it there was a prophecy. Let Claire know that before she dies, she and all her sisters will see me again and receive great consolation from me. Her sisters were comforted. Claire was thankful to the Lord that she would see him again, but once more was not enough. She wanted to be with him. She wanted Francis alive. She wanted her little poverello, who had been her Jesus on earth. The journey to the dream had gone too fast. It couldn't end this way, but it did. She wished, oh, how she wished, that for this short period of time she did not have to set an example. She wanted to be a normal woman for just an hour instead of a mother figure. She wanted to run out, away, over to Santa Maria degli Angeli. She wanted to cradle Francis in her arms. She wanted to bathe him in her tears. She wanted to take away the sickness. She wanted to make him better. She wanted to stop Francis from dying, but she couldn't. The Lord mercifully gave her this, the gift of illness, which kept her a prisoner of her bed. She cried unconsolably until she heard the sound of the funeral procession coming to the front of the church of San Damiano. The body of Francis was brought into the church. Francis had promised Claire she would see him again. Now he was lying dead on a stretcher. Half the town of Assisi was in attendance. This was not what she wanted. She wanted to be with him. She wanted to talk to him. She wanted to listen to his voice. But that was not the gift the Lord gave her. This was her gift. She accepted it. She stopped crying. She opened the grill. The creaking sound of metal grinding against metal ripped through the silence of the church. Everyone focused on the lone figure emerging from behind the enclosure. She walked over to the stretcher. Before her was her love, her role model. He was broken. The body was frail, gray, lifeless. A cold wind blew through the church, ricocheting off the walls. Francis' hair was tossed by the wind, as was his tunic. It was the only movement on his body. Claire looked at him. For a moment, she thought he had blinked his eyes. But it was the wind. Then the wind died down, and Francis was still again. She bent over and kissed his wounded hands, his feet, and side. She painfully rose and took a long, last look at him. She tried to memorize every inch of him. It would have to last her 27 years. She turned and disappeared behind the grill. Among a sea of sisters. Claire never looked back. Francis had kept his promise. We can't say that Claire's stand on the rule of her community, especially as it applied to her loyalty to the Franciscan community, 
and most importantly, poverty, was because Francis was dead. She'd always been firm on this. But now that he had no one to speak for his, in his defense, she became his voice. She may have done this to keep alive the dream of Francis, of which she was such an important part, and which so many of his own were trying to break down. Perhaps her insistence on owning no property or accepting money under any conditions was her way of telling the friars, this is the way Francis wanted it to be. With Francis gone, she concentrated her efforts on the two most important things of her life, her ladies and keeping the rule of Francis intact. She was tough, but in her own special, elegant way, so that while she would not bend in her beliefs, cardinals and popes believed she was doing them a favor by their giving in to her demands. Rules were written for the ladies, Claire rejected them. She was told it was inconceivable that a community could live without some form of property. The friars were accepting property. Claire said no. This was not the rule that Francis wanted, and she would not accept it. Everybody backed down from her. But the final rule, the one she waited for, fought for, didn't come until two days before she died. She was so determined, she even made the Lord wait to take her to paradise until she got what she wanted. Claire's strength was the Eucharist. One time when the Saracens were invading Assisi, the convent was between them and Assisi, and, and they were going to come in and attack. The ladies came up to, Kath to Claire, who was in bed, and they, they were in a panic. What could they do? Could she protect them from the attacking soldiers? They had seen soldiers in the field around the convent. Claire had two sisters help her out of bed. She went to the chapel and removed the monstrance containing the blessed sacrament. She went to a large open window facing the courtyard. But first she prayed to the Lord, protect, Lord, these your servants that I now by myself cannot protect. She heard a sweet voice out of a child. I will take care of you always. Claire turned to the ladies. I guarantee you, my daughters, that you will not suffer any evil. Only have faith in Christ. She took the monstrance, held it high in the air. The advancing Saracens froze in their tracks. They looked up at Claire at the monstrance in her hand, petrified with fear, as if they could recognize the God who was there. They turned and ran for their lives. They left Claire and her sisters in peace. Pope Gregory IX came to Assisi for the canonization of St. Francis. He had stopped at the convent of San Damiano but wanted to go back one more time. So early one morning, bringing his cortege of cardinals with him, he made the trip to the humble, humble convent of the poor ladies. Everyone was truly in a festive mood as His Holiness entered the convent. All the sisters were in rapt attention, eager to hear what he had to say. But he wanted to hear Claire speak. She obediently shared with the Pope the virtues of the new Saint Francis. As they could not get back to Assisi in time for lunch, Claire invited them to share their humble fare of stale bread. The hard pieces of bread were placed on the table. Claire asked the Pope to bless the meal. He asked her to bless it. Out of humility, she said she was a sinner and could not possibly bless the bread, especially in the presence of Christ's vicar on earth. The Pope ordered Claire to bless the bread. She closed her eyes, raised her arm, and blessed the bread. And when she was finished, a gasp of amazement escaped from all present. A large cross had formed on each piece of hardened bread. And this is how the tradition of hot cross buns began. St. Clair has been given the title of patron saint of the airwaves. The foundation of this title is due to a miracle that took place on Christmas Eve, 1252, the year before she died. Claire was too ill to attend midnight mass with her community. She lay there, her heart breaking, as she was to be deprived of the Eucharist on this so special a night. She looked around the bare room that served as the sleeping quarters of the sisters. Suddenly, there was a bright light in the room. She could hear the sound of Christmas hymns being sung in the great basilica of St. Francis in Assisi. She felt herself being lifted out of her bed. The cool breeze of the December night brushed across her face. She was being transported to the church amidst what sounded to her like the voices of angels. She could smell the sweet fragrance of burning candles and altar incense. She was taking part in the midnight mass at the basilica. 
Then she was whisked off to the east, to the Bethlehem of 1,200 years ago. She was before the cave where the infant Jesus was born with St. Joseph and Mary. St. Jo Joseph led Jesus to her. He came to her as a grown man and placed the sacred host in her mouth. Then she was transported back to the convent. When her sisters came up from there, she shared her experience. As they all fell off into a peaceful Christmas slumber, the sound of distant angels singing, glory to God in the highest, be heard. Claire was tired. She missed Francis. It had been 27 years since she had seen him. She wanted to go home, but she could not leave her sisters until the rule had been finally accepted. During the first week of August, the Pope visited Assisi. He wanted to visit her that week. She pleaded with him to give her rule the approval. He gave her a verbal approval, but she said it was not enough. She needed his signature and his seal. The Pope promised he would do it. Claire held out for a week. She was suffering great pain physically, but spiritually, it was as if she had already entered the kingdom. Word got back to the Pope who was staying at the Basilica of St. Francis that Claire would die any moment. He realized he had forgotten to give her the approval. He took a rule and bypassed the formal procedures. He wrote his approval on the rule itself and sent it to the convent of San Damiano. She received it on August 10th. She kissed it. She died the next day. Claire's body for over 700 years has remained incorrupt for all to see and venerate. Claire is a role model for all women in headship, not exclusively of the church, but especially of the church. She may very well have been placed on this earth to be a prototype for superiors of religious communities, male and female, for centuries to come. Claire could easily be the standard bearer for anyone who would lead a community of people, whether it be a religious community as superior or a country as a president or a king. And her philosophy was not new or complicated. It was simple. It was that of all of them. Love one another as I